I'm going to drive during the message or something. I don't know. You know what that was all about today? Just got distracted by that good worship and then kind of lost my place a little bit. Y'all doing well this morning? Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Y'all doing well this morning? Good to see you. Good to see you. Sorry, I had to, had to grab that. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just one of them people that, that even during worship, I'm, I'm going to sweat a little bit. So that's just how it's going to be. It could probably be 32 degrees in here. I'm still... So we're going to sweat to somebody saying, good morning, good to have you this morning, good to be back with you this morning. Last week, I had the privilege of being with Pastors Kevin and Andrea Reed at City Heart Church in Jackson as they celebrate their sixth year anniversary. I get to serve as an overseer for them, and they asked me to come in for their sixth anniversary, had a great time. Uh, there and uh, some of that is really going to have an effect even on what we're doing today. And so, uh, if you would, if you got your Bibles, go to Numbers chapter 13 is where I'm going to go today. Before I jump into the message, three quick things I want to mention to you. Uh, how many of you all enjoy Gabe Malone leading worship and the team? Do you all enjoy them today? No? Okay, that doesn't that really sound like we enjoy them. That's not like they're all right. They're all right, you know. They're all right, you know. I don't know if y'all realize, like, I mean, we, we are very, very blessed to have a very good team, and God's blessed us, and I'm grateful, grateful for them, and as he continues, and as they continue to grow, and as he continues to grow in his leadership, what we do is we want to do through some things called prioritizing the presence of God. Does anybody know what I mean by that? What that means is when, when worship happens, do you ever kind of, in, in worship service, do you ever kind of wish, like, man, I wish they just keep going, and it's nothing personal. It's not you're like, well, I can't stand Pastor Jane, but it's just like, but, but it's just when that, that, that presence of God, come on, y'all can admit that, right? Are we good? I'm that way. Trust me, I tell our team, I was like, hey, I'm looking forward to the service where I don't get up, where I can't get up, where God's just doing it. And so I'm, I'm just, I just get to sit right there and like, well, the Lord just take over. And so uh, I, I'm grateful for that. But I also know in our lives, how many of you ever, like, do you ever wonder, like, how come I feel so good after the music? Anybody ever wonder that? That's not just entertainment. Remember, God created music. Oh, well, well, did I hit on something? Did we miss that? Did we forget? Like, God created music. He created it. And it was created for a purpose. It could reach you at a place where he desired to reach you. And so what we want to do is, again, continue. As God continues to work in our church, we want to make space for you to do that. Here's what it's going to cost you. Time. Okay. And so not always, every, every service is not meant for everything. And so as much as sometimes we want to, if the Lord moves, in, and trust me, we'll know, uh, he takes over service, it's, it's his service, he can do what he wants. Um, but Sundays, you know, there are times where we're worshiping, and then there's time for, for teaching or instruction or encouragement, whatever the Lord would do. But we want to make room for when just, just again, it's purposeful, set-apart time where we make the presence of the Lord the priority. So there's no like set agenda. There's no, hey, we, just, we just trust and we're going to worship. So that first night, night of worship, is going to be Sunday, October the 2nd. Everybody say October the 2nd. 6 p.m. It is a night of worship. That's exactly what it is. It's going to be one hour. It is going to be right here. Gabe and the team are going to lead us into the presence of the Lord, and we're just going to see where it goes. Okay? I want you to come out. I want you to take, listen, what I, it's going to cost you what? Time, time. Pastor James, I'm going to come up here. No one's going to come and say, you know, offering. We, we're not worried about that. The Lord's going to take care of our needs. We're good. We're good. It's not an extra service, so we can get another offering out of you. We don't do that. We don't do that. So you, it, it, it's so that, that we're not trying to get something from you. We're trying to get something to you. And so I'm encouraging you to come out on October the 2nd, 6 p.m., night of worship. It kicks off our next part. Here's the next one. Seven days of prayer, October 2nd through the 8th. All of this is intentional because we believe that we've got a divine appointment that we got to meet. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. So this is our, our fall time, seven days of prayer, October 2nd through the 8th, dedicated season of prayer as we get ready for our first time in our history, our, our fall revival, which is going to be the, uh, in, in October as well, right after October uh, the 9th through the 12th. And so I'm encouraging you, all those three events are leading into those four days. Those are four nights. 6 p.m., uh, starting there, my friend, Pastor John Collier, is coming over from Birmingham, England, to be with us for those four days. Uh, I'm excited about them as well. I'm excited because I get to receive and grow with you as well. Together as a church, we're making the Lord the priority. 
And so these four days are purposeful days where you're going to go to work that day, but I want you to prepare. I want you meal prep. I want you to do whatever you can to make sure you're here by 6 o'clock that evening. And we're going to dive into what the Lord has for us. I have no idea what John is going to speak about. I've known him for over 20 years. I also don't know if I know many people that have a passion for God like John does. And I'm excited because I get to grow with you. Together, we're growing. And how many know, like, it's, it's kind of one of the, anybody ever seen where somebody, if, they, if they're lifting weights and they take one arm and they keep doing this, but they never work out this one? How's that going to look eventually? It look really weird, right? Because one arm's going to be all big and bulky, like Pastor James is. It's going to be big and bulky. And then one's going to be kind of, you know, just like thin. And you're like, that looks weird, out of balance. Well, that's what happens when we don't grow together. Amen. Something looks out of balance. And so, hey, I mean, that's not the way the Lord planned on it. So it's a time for all of us to grow together. I'm asking you, have it be a priority. I believe I've heard from the Lord about that season, and it's why we planned it. And so I'm encouraging you. It is not a fundraiser. It is not so we take four other offerings. All I'm asking you to bring is your heart and a willingness and an openness for what God is going to do. And church, I will tell you, we are not going to be the same. Amen. Young people, I encourage you, if you can make it, come on, I know you have practice. Come in your uniforms. Or I don't care. You can be filthy. Dirt. I don't care. Come on. I don't care what you got. Come on. No one's going to worry about you. Nobody's going to worry about you. We got bathrooms. If you want to go in there, you can, you can you do whatever you got to do, put on deodorant, whatever you want to do, or you just come in here smelling. I don't really care. Just come on out. Just come on out. Okay, whatever it takes. I'm asking you to be here. Okay? We've got a big event at the, the school district that week. As you all know, I serve on the board there. And I've already told our superintendent, I, I, I just won't be there that day. This is the priority. The Lord is the priority. So I'm encouraging church. If you do this, here's what scripture says. He says, draw close to me, and I'll draw close to you. And if you ever want to know what that looks like at a different level, Amen. I'm asking you. I'm, I'm begging you. Literally begging you. Would you give God space? And I promise you, if you come, he's going to do something amazing. It is not about John Collier. It is about Jesus. And we're going to go there together. Amen? Okay. All right. With that being said, all right, we are, we're good there. I need y'all to help me. Uh, Pastor Nisi and I got into a little bit of a disagreement this morning on the way to church. Uh, she did not understand that me being the man that I'm right. And, and so uh, I brought, came today for you all to confirm that. And what I need for you all to do is I need you to confirm, because I, I know what I've said, but I'm gonna, I'll leave it to you all because I want it to be, and, and we're recording, so I can play it for her later. She's serving with kids. She did that on purpose so she wouldn't have to be here to hear that I'm right. Um, but I need to know what is the accurate way of making this statement. The yolk of the eggs is white. What is the accurate way of it? The yolk of the eggs is why, what, what, what's the accurate way of saying that statement? Okay, y'all go sit there and tell you speak to me? Don't leave, because you know I'm right. She knows I'm right. The yolk of the egg is white. Who, who agrees? Who agrees the yolk of the egg is white? Okay. What? It's yellow. That's the accurate way of making that statement. The yolk of the egg is yellow. It's not white, is it? And here's why I'm going to tell you today. Have you ever heard someone give a response to a question you asked, but it wasn't an answer to the question that you actually asked? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the yolk of the eggs is white. Right, I said, I asked you, what was the accurate way of making this statement? And the accurate way is that the yolk of the eggs is, is, of the eggs is yellow. And so sometimes, like, it, sometimes you ever give it, let me go one step, one step further. Have you ever had someone answer a question that you didn't ask them? Anybody ever have that? It's Truthful Sunday, it's Truthful Sunday. It seems to be that spirit is released most often in restaurants. In restaurants. So I order a ribeye, can you, can you add some blue cheese crumbles or some sauteed mushrooms to my steak? 
That's what I asked. What I get is that'll be a dollar thirty-two extra. The steak is thirty-one dollars. Am I really worried about the one dollar and thirty-two cents to get the blue cheese crumbles and the mushrooms that I? Am I hearing me just yet? Is it just me or? In answering questions, I didn't, I didn't ask how much it was. Clearly, that's not my concern. My concern is in the kitchen where they're working miracles. Would they happen to be able to scrape up some blue cheese crumbles and some mushrooms to put on my steak? Because the issue is I'm committed already. The cost is not the issue. The issue is can you meet? Anybody hearing me yet? Somebody answering a question that you didn't ask. I want to talk to you this morning about that, about a question that, that you didn't ask. And I'm going to help you remember it by three ways. I want you to do this real simple. I want to talk about today. I want to talk about giants. I want to talk about grapes. I want to talk about giants. I want to talk about grasshoppers. Grapes, giants, grasshoppers. Numbers chapter 13, let's start at verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses... Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. Who is giving the land? I'm sorry. Help help me out. Come on. This this is an interactive church. You're good. You're good. No one's going to kick you out for saying one thing, mostly. All right. Anybody here? Come on. Who's giving the land? Okay. I'm just checking. I'm just okay because I want to make sure because sometimes I I read it wrong. All right. So so send one leader from each of the 12 tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out 12 men, all tribal leaders of Israel from their camp in the wilderness of Paran. Jumping down to verse 17. Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north of the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Uh, Do their towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or pure? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting of the first ripe grapes. And when they came to the valley of Eshcol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes. So large it took two of them to carry it on a pole between them. Somebody say grapes. There's some some grapes, right? This ain't no muscadines, okay? Here's some grapes. And when you got to put it on a pole to carry it between two people who, now think about, think about what's happening here. I know we like kind of, we have the little Bible characters and we, we see two little people carrying a pole. But remember, these are people that have gone on a hike. These are physically fit men. It takes two of these mountain climbing, hiking, physically fit men to carry one cluster of grapes on a pole. Can y'all say some grapes? Grapes, yeah, yeah, my grandmother made some good wine out of them grapes. She was big grapes, big old grapes. All right, stay with me, stay with me. All right, so, uh, so took to carry them on a pole between them. They also brought back samples of pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshcol, which means cluster, because the cluster of grapes the Israelite men brought there. So you know it's a big cluster if they're going to name it after grapes. Come on, anybody hear me? Were we still good? I just want, because I know we passed by, but sometimes you got to stop a little bit and see what's there. Let's keep going. After exploring the land for how long? 40 days. Here's that number again. 40 days. So they had time, right? It wasn't a quick look. It wasn't like, it wasn't like, let's just stop and see. They had time to look. Okay. All right. The men returned to Moses and Aaron and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and indeed, a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
Here is the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. And the Amalekites live in the Gev and the Hittites and Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. Anybody hearing an answer to a question they did not get asked? Where did, where did Moses ever say, you all get, come back and give an evaluation as to whether we can take the land that God said he's giving us. Never ask that question, but we're going to give an answer. We can't go up there. We, oh, let me keep going because I'm letting it speak for itself. All right, keep going. So here we go. We, you know, he, he goes, we can't go. We disagree. We, we can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread the bad report about the land. That's the whole other message right there. Let's keep going. Among the Israelites, the land we traveled though through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people saw, we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, second time. Descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. How do they know what they thought? How do they know what they thought about them? We were grasshoppers, but they, that's what they thought too. Do you ever hear like, anybody ever have like friends like that, that, that they say stuff to you? Like, you know what I heard? And you know for sure. You know where they heard it? In their house alone by themselves. I, I heard, I heard they're going to, I heard, I, uh, where, where, let me give you here, spiritual insight. One word will fix all that. Where, where did you hear that? Ready? Here's, here's what you're going to get. I can't remember. That's Greek for out of my own head. <laughs> it started right here. And it kept rumbling around all up in that space till finally it made its way to my lips and I let it out. And what I'm really, what I'm saying, I heard, what you, what, what, I mean, are you hearing me yet? We have those people. I heard, I heard, I heard. Facebook is full of I heards. I heard. I heard this is going on in the community. I heard, I heard, I heard. Let me give you a real example. Let me tell you what heard. Let me give you one real example. I remember one of my first years on the school board. Uh, we, somebody had, had, had seen something and a parent went on and, and they went online. And you know what they said? I heard, I heard that the kids are being held on the third floor of the high school. High school didn't even have a third floor. Third, third floor. Parents, what I love, it's not just, not just here, not just in the, not where this district I guy serving. I'm learning as I meet other board members as well. There are things that, that just go rampant because we heard. I, I heard, I heard, I heard they're going to kick kids out of school. What, what, uh, what, what was that based on? That's them trying to recall. I don't know, but I heard it. Like, you're supposed to just take it as facts. <laughs> I heard, I heard. And why I want to talk to you about that is this. I want to talk to us today, real simple, won't even be long. Three things you're going to face when God calls you to move from surviving to thriving. Where, where, where my young people are? You still there? Still there? Stay with me. Stay with me because everybody got to find their way in. Because there are seasons where God calls you that he says, I'm going to give you something. And if your first response is to take a survey of everybody around you to see if they think it's a good thing for what God's going to give you, then you're going to constantly always be a person that's behind and complaining about the blessings of God in other people's life when he offered you the blessing, but you wanted people's approval first. 
You got to choose to say, Lord, if you said it, that settles it. And if they don't like the fact that I'm getting it, they're going to have to dislike it, but they're going to dislike it in my past, not in my future. And you have to do it. And here's the call. It's when God, and it's not our brain, it's about God going, I want you to go from, from just surviving to thriving because he's talking to people that are the children of slaves. He's telling you, you've only known how to be dominated. You've only known how to be told what to do. You've only been known how to do what they made you do. Now you get to be the boss. Now you're going to have to dream. Now you're going to have to build. Now you're going to have to be inventive. Now you're going to have to learn how to treat people. So you got to go from just surviving to thriving. It's the difference between playing not to lose or playing to win. He's telling you you got to play to win. He's telling when God calls you to start living to win and not just living to breathe. Three things you're going to face. Three things you're going to face. Here's this first one, grapes. And grapes represent, say, opportunity. First thing you're going to face is opportunity. Can you see the blessing of the Lord in the middle of the challenges? Two people carrying grapes on a pole can you see the opportunity? The opportunity is, is that, hey, if it takes that much, we're going to have to learn how to work together. If two of us are carrying this pole, if we don't work together, how many of they're not going to make that trek all the way back home? Hey, hey, here's what the blessing of the Lord means. We're going to have to learn to work together. Hey, what God is going to do in our church it's not just meant to exalt agape. In fact, that's not the purpose at all. What God wants to do is exalt Jesus. And church, we can't go and when God moves greatly in our church, we can't build fences. We can't even build altars. We build relationships. We call our brothers and sisters from around and say, how can we help? How can we be a benefit? How can we continue to spread what God's doing? Can y'all hear me? Can you hear me? Hey, church. Hey, newsflash. I have zero desire in making Agape's name great. I have every desire to spend the rest of my life making Jesus' name great and known as much as I can. And I pray we would be the same. That it's not about you or me and 15 minutes of fame. It's about an eternity that people are going to spend away from God if we don't lift Jesus higher. Opportunity. We're going to have to learn to work together. We're going to have to meet needs. Here's the great, grace was so big. Here's what else it shows. The opportunities that we're not just going to just have our needs met, but these graves are so big, we're going to be able to meet other people's needs too. Can you all imagine that one? That it's not just about us. How about we're going to help somebody else? That God blesses us to be a blessing. Can I ask you one thing? Have you ever asked the Lord to put you in a position where you can be a blessing in the middle of your need? Have you ever asked God to not just meet your need, but Lord, give me enough to where I can be a blessing to somebody else? Young man that was, I was mentoring when he was in college, he was going on a mission trip to China. He needed to raise money and he was strong in faith. I mean, he, his family had raised it. He, he had no doubt to believe uh, what, that God could do it. And so he was just talking to me about it. And I mean, he was just extremely like, like full of faith. And so I felt like, like there was a challenge. And I just remember sitting there across when we were talking and, and the Lord just said, just, just challenge him. And I knew, I, I just, so we were sitting here across and I, I said, hey, I said, what if you didn't just raise the money for you? What if you're able to sponsor somebody else on your team to go? And he looked and he's all, I'm going to do that. I'm going to believe God for that. And so he shifted his whole, what he's believed for, not just his need, but he said, Lord, I want to sponsor somebody else to go. Do you know that college student that didn't have the money to even go himself, raised enough for himself, and he sponsored another, his friend to go as well because he saw the opportunity in the middle of the challenge. When he had a need, he didn't just stop at, Lord, meet my need. 
He went and said, Lord, not only meet my need, but Lord, provide for somebody else's. Use me to be a blessing. There's always opportunity. Here's the second one that you're going to do is it's called giants. It's called opposition. Say opposition. That was not good enough. Opposition. Say that with me. Yeah, because if we don't say it strong, so you'll say it strong when it comes, but we won't say it strong before it gets here. And when you know that opposition is coming, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to live scared. You don't have to like sit there and quiver and hope Satan don't come after you and, and devil loose and all that. People that understand that opposition is coming are like cage fighters. It's what I do. I fight for a living. Believers do this same. I fight for a living. I know there's not a devil out there that's going to give me anything. He ain't going to give me my healthy family. Not going to give me a successful marriage. Not going to give us a church that loves Jesus. So what I do is I fight for a living. This is what I do. This is, we just, we just, until we get on the other side, we're just spiritual cage fighters. Somebody going to have to eat and might as well be me. So we got opposition. Becky Hooper gave it to me like this. It's a step of faith a plan towards our future. It's a strategic act of war, a deliberate offensive maneuver against the enemy. Anytime I decide to pursue God, this is where it's going. It's deliberate, it's, a, it's absolute. I, instead of him declaring war on me, we decide I'm declaring war on you. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. No, I, no, no, this is war, this is war. It's war for a lot more than just here. The plan of God for your life, your family, your church has enemies, but Scripture says they will not prevail. And what you have to watch out for when you have opposition is this thing I'm going to watch you call faith thieves. Somebody say faith thieves. Yeah, you got to watch out for faith thieves. Faith thieves love answering questions they were not asked. They love giving their opinion in an area where they don't have responsibility. And they love gathering allies to support their opinion. Faith thieves come in with one purpose, just to steal your faith or what you believe. So they do those very things. They got an opinion about everything that you didn't ask. Want to steal your, oh, is it real? It's real, real Sunday today. And to the visitors, I'm glad you came. I'm sorry if it offended, but I'm so glad you came. I'm believing maybe the Lord's got something for you as well today. That faith thieves, here's where they will come in and, 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 and gather allies. We call it the, the, the gathering ally. That's my nice way of saying gossip. My nice way, my spirit, the pastoral way of saying gossip. To build support for their opinion. But they don't have responsibility, don't have no skin in the game. I love ones that don't have no skin in the game. I love ones that don't have to pay, don't have to do one thing, but they got all the opinions and cost them nothing. Don't, don't, it don't, matter, don't cost them nothing to open their mouth and cost them nothing about everything that's going on in your life. Can't handle their own kids, but know how you need to raise yours. Can't, 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 can't keep their stuff. You won't fight for their marriage, but know what you need to do for yours. And it's usually telling you, you need to leave. You need to let that demon go and tell it that they need to go somewhere. We got to contend and we got to fight. Knowing how everybody need to run their classroom. Gonna go up to the school. Tell them what they need to do. This is why you need to teach. Then how about you go home? Somebody has a degree in how to do that. And if you want to teach, then homeschool. But how about you stop going up there and teaching your child how to be disrespectful to authority? How about we stop it? How about we stop applauding the foolishness? How about we stop acting that way in the grocery store and the school? Since some of us want to exclude ourselves because I don't go up to the school, but you do it in the grocery store. You do it in the restaurants and you're going to do it in the name of Jesus and it's got to stop. No, because you know how to run Kroger better than the manager. Ain't had one day experience, but you know how the vegetables need to look. You know what needs to be put on the shelves. You need to go with what's on the, uh, these are on the stores and uh, what, what needs to be put on. They, why they always, how come ain't no lines? Oh, you don't know one bit about what it took to hire somebody. You don't know one bit about what it takes. You don't know what shortages they have. You don't know what they're going through. But God forbid, if you can't get your French onion dip and somebody running across the scanner, 
Father, we just got, we travail over it. <laughs> and you know what I'm going to do because I'm so mad? Let me get on Facebook and tell them how many this is. <laughs> Oh, because that's going to solve it. No, you got an audience with the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but you want to go to that demon instead. That's why you get that reward. The reward, everybody going, but no change. Oh, get them. Get em. I agree with you. People you don't even know going to agree with you. You're like, thank you. Bless you. They don't know you. They don't like you. It might not even be a real account. But you're so grateful. My comment, my comment got 864 likes. You know what? You're lacking one, though. It came from God. He didn't like it. He didn't do anything about it. What's your 864 likes going to do? Not one thing. Didn't change nothing. But one like from Jesus. Faith thieves. Then we got the ones that talk about opposition. Opposition is never a valid reason to disobey God. Just because they disagree is not reason enough to disobey God. Hey, Christian, you're going to have to make some tough decisions in this life. It ain't for you, but you're going to make some tough decisions. Hey, young people, hear me. The quicker you get it, the quicker you understand that if you're waiting on somebody to do this before you'll do what's right, you better break their arm and move on and get free. Choose right now. Understand, everybody ain't going to like you. That's how this life goes. Everybody's not, and that's a hard deal. Even as a pastor, it's hard. It's hard when people don't like the church. It's hard when they don't like you. It's hard when they call, you know, and, oh, you know, you go too long. And, oh, you know, why do we got to get stand worship? Uh, Thursday be this. Uh, it's too cold. It's too hot. Listen, and, and look, feedback. I'm learning. Pastor James is growing in, in learning to receive feedback better because a good leader should be able to look and receive feedback from anybody. So it's not about the feedback. But it's also about this. It's also about, hey, we got, we got to make sure, you got to understand, everybody's not going to like you. And here's what that will set you free from. You don't get to an attitude where you're like, I don't even care about people. No, that's not real, because you do. I don't care what people think. Yes, you do, because the mere fact you said that means you just proved it. Like, honestly, you just proved it. Here's the issue, though. Here's the issue. You got to understand they're not going to. What it keeps you from doing is it's the spiritual guard to keep you from becoming a man pleaser to where you will sacrifice your integrity for someone to like you or their approval. So you got to understand, it's never a valid reason. Opposition is never a valid reason to disobey God. And opposition to, it is, not a, it is not a valid assessment of the accuracy of the leaders hearing God's direction. Back in when we were Agape Church in California, we were ready to buy our new property. We were actually, we were outgrown a warehouse. We didn't own it. Felt like the Lord had called us to own property, and so we, were bought, we bought 10 acres out there, and we had now, all of a sudden, all the neighbors got upset, and the neighbors said, we don't want a church in our neighborhood, and, and so we had a lot of opposition. And then, the, of course, when you make enough noise, the government gets involved, and our leadership in our county said that in order for us to build, we would have to do something called an environmental impact report. It's basically a fancy book report. It says what lives out there. And the cost of that environmental impact report, which doesn't get you one thing, for us was $200,000 that we had to spend before we could put one shovel in the ground. $200,000. Not one parking lot, not one light, not one stick in there. That's a lot of wood. That's a lot of chairs. That's a lot of equipment. No, we're going to provide them a book report. Stop position. And church here, I don't know who this is for, but somebody has determined, like, because there's opposition, like, like, all of a sudden you're doubting what God told you. Hey, what you got to do is get in alignment. And what we did, we said, Lord, if that's the price, then clearly you knew it. And so, uh, Lord, we're we, we going to need you to go and provide for that. And can I tell you that he did? Can I tell you that he did? Because the key was obedience. In fact, 
when, we, uh, when they knew that and they found out that they told us we'd have to do that $200,000 report, one of the neighbors even wrote us a letter and said, now that you're in this position, we're here to offer you this much. I mean, it was nothing to buy the land from us. At that point, I was an associate pastor, and, and I asked my pastor if I could respond. He said, let me see it first. <laughs> my first letter that I wrote, he wouldn't let me send. So just, just I wasn't always nice. Pastor James, been, the Lord's saving me. Okay, he's, he's still working on it. But I, 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 it was about a four-word four response. He wouldn't let me send on church letterhead or nothing. I said, I can spray paint it on the fence. Wouldn't let me do that. So then I crafted another letter once I kind of got out of myself and crafted another letter and I said this, it is in our corporate law to this day. We would be absolutely disobedient to the plan of God for our church if we sold you this land just because there's a challenge. The vision is not for sale. Hey, God, I want you to understand something. The vision is not for sale. We may change the methods on everything we do, but the vision God gave for this church is not for sale. And so we did, God provided. But one of our staff members, I remember, said something to us and said, you know, maybe we ought to consider the fact there's so much opposition that maybe we didn't hear from God. I thought, you hadn't walked that ground late at night like me and the pastor had speaking to it, telling it was going to produce, that it was going to do some things for Jesus. You didn't drive stakes in the ground with scriptures written on them at the four corners of the property because we knew God had spoken to us and he was going to provide. You hadn't sown anything into that. So until you do, you can save that for somebody else. When you want to get out there and and do the hard work that's before you get to build anything, can you build in the spirit first? If you want to do that work and then say you felt like the Lord told you about opposition, but, but by your own human instincts that opposition means that we didn't hear from God, you can keep that. And church, some of you all are in that very same place. God's spoken to you about a dream. This is not about listening because somebody's right there but going buy a new car that you shouldn't get. It's not about cars. It's not about equipment. It's not about shoes. This is talking about destiny. God ordained projects that he puts in your life. Something that is going to not just bless you, but bless everybody outside of you. When God speaks in that place, that's where when just because you get opposition does not mean that that you didn't hear from God. It means there's a real devil that wants to take you out and you got to decide, no, I know, Lord, I'm burning in this. And I'll tell you this, there are places in your life where you can ask everybody around you and those godly people and they will never see it like you see it because the Lord gave that vision to you. It wasn't for Moses to go around and take a survey and go, you think I should go in and set the people free? You think I need to go and speak to Pharaoh? What do you think? No, he had a burning bush that he approached. But what he didn't know is the Lord put that same burning of that bush in his chest. And that's why he couldn't. That's why he was called a friend of God. That's why he couldn't be deterred. That's why he'd rather turn on the people before he turned on God because he put something there that burned. And opposition from Pharaoh didn't stop him because he heard what the Lord said. Is anybody hearing me yet today? Here's this last one. Last one is grasshoppers. Say grasshoppers. It is ownership of your identity. When you're going to move from surviving to thriving, the third thing you're going to have to face is ownership of your identity. Scripture says that they said next to them, we, we feel like grasshoppers. And that's what they felt too. So when we used to come down here to visit, my family in Ellersville, we drive down from St. Louis and we had a house right there on Wadsworth Road, right in the Jenkins community out there. Dirt road, didn't get paved till I was much older. And so we're out there and I remember like, we go out on the front porch, there's a porch and then I go out on the steps. I remember I saw these things in Ellersville, Mississippi that I had not seen in St. Louis. They were these grasshoppers. They were this big and they were black. 
Nobody's ever seen those, right? No one's ever seen those things. I remember those things. I remember when I was sitting there minding my own business and one of them came right up on me right next to my hand and was the size of my hand. I remember looking down at it and it looking up at me. I don't know if it exactly said, but I had one of the moments I talked to you about it, what I heard. You know what I heard? I heard it say to me, you up in my neighborhood. I run this grass. So if you, if you, if you got something, come with it, because I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm right here, looking up at me. I am, I mean, I'm over 100 times the size of that grasshopper. I looked at it, I said, I, could st- I, th- I thought I could stand up, I could step on you, crush you. You know what I did? I got up, I went in that house, I closed that door, let him have his grass. <laughs> because that thing could have, should have had a leash on it, as big as it was. We felt like grasshoppers in their sight, and that's what they thought too. Can I just ask one little question, one little question. What if the giants were scared of grasshoppers? What, what if the giants were, like they said, we felt like grasshoppers. What if the giants had an irrational fear of grasshoppers? All of a sudden, who's in the power position? Not the giants, right? Here's why you don't take your rationale, why you got to have a Christ identity rather than your own. If you got the Lord with you, you could be the most terrifying grasshopper to the biggest giant that there is because the Lord is with you. It don't matter what you look like in their eyes. Who do you say I am? Lord, you said I'm the biggest, baddest grasshopper there is. It's my lawn. Y'all got to move. Or you might be the giant that says, this is my land. You're not going to, anybody hear me? You've got to have a Christ identity before you buy into this. You, you can't just keep confidence in your earthly identity and expect to do kingdom business. You got to let that go and you got to choose to have God's identity. And so the kingdom operates on authority and authority comes when you embrace your God-given Christ identity. Come on, y'all still with me this morning? I'm done. Stand to your feet right where you are and just need you to help. Come on, right, y'all stand. Come on, I'm done. I'm done. Unless you want to keep preaching, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. Okay, well, 12 more minutes. Okay, no, okay, stay with me. Stay with me right where you are. I need you to repeat after me. We good? We good? We good? Oh, Lord, they're not good. Drew, you going, they, they're not going to help me at all, Drew, at all, at all. Okay, y'all good? We good? I need you to repeat after me. I am well able. able. Oh, Father, help this Lutheran church (laughs) in here. Dr. Burgess, they won't eat. I I, I just need, I need, I need just more Baltimore in them. That's all I need. Okay, I am well able. I am well able. I promise you, I want you to say it because it's not going to be a hype thing. You're going to need this tomorrow. You're going to need it on Wednesday. You're going to need it from time when we're not going to have a message or a service. You're going to need to know it. So I want you to rehearse it like you got to say it loud in your own car when nobody's around so that you're not speaking to God about your problems. You speak to your problems about God. Say, I am well able because he is more than able. I can do all things because he's already done everything. I'm more than a conqueror because he destroyed everything. I believe all things are possible for me because I asked the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-willing, all-able God to do what he does on my behalf according to his plan. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Not going back. Not going back. Not going back. If you're here today, head bowed, eyes closed where you are today. If you're here today in the first place, you need to move from surviving to thriving. It's very simply this. You need to surrender your life to Jesus. 
You go from surviving in your own power to saying, Lord, I can't take one more breath without you. You begin to thrive because you say, Lord, I'm not going to try and control it myself. I'm going to thrive. I'm going to stop surviving. I'm going to start thriving. It starts with you, Jesus. There's a song that said, the ordinary just won't do. I got to have a touch from you. I could always find it in you, Jesus. If you're here today and you need to surrender your life to Jesus for the first time, or you need to rededicate your life right where you are, please don't wait one more second in this very safe place. Do so boldly lift your hands and say, Pastor James, it's me. I am moving from surviving to thriving. Pastor James, I'm not going to take one more second in this mess that I'm in. I'm choosing Jesus. Anybody today needs to make that decision. I'm checking the main floor. I'm checking the balcony. I'm trusting them that we are all in the right place, and I'm grateful for that today. Thank you, God. Now, if you're here today, at the end of service, when they begin to worship, if you just need, if you're facing a surviving or thriving situation where you need to absolutely get some prayer support in what you're facing, I'm encouraging our prayer team is in the back. Would you please go see them during the worship time? We do that because I know that we're sensitive about people all up in our business. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to be hungrier than what you're facing and go get someone to agree with you in prayer. Don't leave today. Again, facing what you're facing alone. Jeff and Kim are back on this side, on the other side of the auditorium to my left, your right. I encourage you during the worship time, would you go and get someone to agree with you? If we need some more people, they'll get them. But I'm asking you to commit in your heart that I'm going to move from surviving to thriving today. Father, I give you thanks for our church. I continue to ask that you continue to establish us as a light in this community, that you use our relationships to attract others to you, that people would detect the divine element in our church's life and lifestyle. I pray, Lord, you grant us success in such a way that people that are far from you would sit up and take notice. And those people would know and understand that what they see is only possible by your hand and with your help. In Jesus' name.